Hello everyone. I hope you're doing well today. It's really good to be back here with you. Um, once again, my name is Casey and I'm here to talk to you about artwork throughout art history. It's been a little while since the last time I spoke to you all. And again, um, since then though, we've been through some changes and we've also been in a period of sameness or stagnation. Things may feel like they're changing and they also may feel like they're the same. And both of those scenarios can cause us a lot of anxiety or worry or restlessness, especially as the weather is starting to get nicer outside. Maybe those feelings of restlessness are growing. And um, when you're feeling those periods of restlessness and worry and anxiety, it can sometimes feel hard to find structure in the day or to feel like there's something that's keeping your engagement. And my hope for us is art history and talking about artwork can engage us in a way um, that a lot of other activities cannot. It's the beautiful thing about images is even if you don't consider yourself an artist or you don't consider yourself an art historian, Artwork is beautiful in the fact that we can find some way to connect to any artwork that we see, even if we don't know that much about art to begin with. And looking at artwork or engaging in something creative, and maybe for you that's cooking or, or any sort of other creative activity, allows us to join in a, a period of curiosity and creativity that keeps us in the present moment. We might be feeling anxiety and restlessness for so many other things in our world right now, but artwork has a way to bring us into the moment we're experiencing together right now. And my hope is for the next um, 40 minutes or so as I give a talk on a new artist today, we're able to join in that communal experience together and we may be in all separate places, uh, but we're able to come together for this talk right now. And so um, before we get started, I always like to begin our talks together with a little bit of meditation or just centering back to our breath. Again, just like looking at artwork, that can really bring us to the present moment and let us let go of anything that's kind of keeping in our heads from before the talk or even thinking about what we have to do after the talk. So let's kind of join in that process together right now. So. You might be sitting in your living room, you might be sitting in an office, who knows, but wherever you are, you're probably sitting down. So let's kind of feel your seat and kind of settle into your seat a little bit. Separate your feet and kind of press them against the ground firmly and kind of sit up straight. And you can rest your hands on your lap, face up or face down. And I suggest you either close your eyes or just kind of put your gaze softly downward and focus on something, but don't really give it your full attention. Just kind of rest your eyes. Great. And let's take a few deep breaths together. Ah, so as you take your breaths, feel your chest expand and you lift your body just a little bit. So we'll take a breath in. Lift that body up and let it go and lower your shoulders down. Let's go one more time. Breathe it in. Lift up like a string is pulling you further upward and then let it go. Let's do that a couple more times. And as we breathe in, imagine all the fresh new air, breathing in that curiosity and present moment and let go of that restlessness with your out breath and feel that stale air kind of leave your body as we join in this together. <sighs> and feel free to even add a little sound with me because sometimes I feel like adding sound can really make me feel like I'm letting something go. So let's kind of do a couple more breaths with sound today. <sighs> Last one. <sighs> All right. Hello again. Now that we're a little grounded today and we're a little bit more in this moment, 
let's dive into the artwork. Before we take that artwork down, before I get the next one up, as I kind of introduce our artist. I gave you a sneak preview there. <laughs> but let's go back to introducing him. So when I was thinking about what artists to feature today, I was looking back on other artists we've talked about. We have looked at artists who are European. Um, we've looked at artists from Mexico, Japan, some from the United States, but mostly from other countries. And I really thought I would bring the art home to us today, bring the artists home to us, not just in the United States, and not just even in Illinois, but let's look at a, Chicago, a famous Chicago artist. And a lot of you may know the work of this artist. Maybe you've even seen some of his shows, or you have um, been exposed to his work living in the city as well. And you may know who I'm talking about. We're ta we are talking about Roger Brown today, the artist Roger Brown. And what made me think of him immediately is that some of you may know, and some may not, that I studied um, art therapy at the Art Institute of Chicago today. Well, not today, but <laughs> when I was going to school. And when I was there as a graduate student at the Art Institute, Roger Brown, we learned that Roger Brown also attended the Art Institute of Chicago many years ago. And he still has a connection to the school today and he links the artists teaching at SAIC, or the School of the Art Institute, to himself by allowing us to view his artwork and learn about his story as students. And so when I was a graduate student at the Art Institute, I myself learned about Roger Brown, and I got to see his artwork. And he, knowing he went to school just like me, kind of gives you a sense of connection to him. And that's why he's the artist that immediately came to my head when I thought about talking about a Chicago artist today. And so it might feel like we're stepping into a little bit of Chicago history together. And later on in the talk, we'll actually explore how Roger Brown left a legacy for us Chicagoans through his work and through his spaces. And so we'll talk about that later in the talk after we kind of go through the artwork that he has um, done throughout his lifetime. Okay, so first things first, let's take a look at Roger Brown. Here he is. Now, this is a photograph of Roger Brown in his Chicago studio in 1983. And he had already been painting for about 20 years at this point. Um, but I think it's a great photo to show who Roger Brown is because we see him working on his artwork in his Chicago studio and you can't get more Roger Brown than that. But we see him here, he's facing our camera, he's looking pretty solemn and serious and we see um, one of his more iconic street scene paintings in the background here. And in this photo he is 42 years old. And he's already well into his art career, as I mentioned. He'd already been painting for about two decades. But, um, so this is, as a lot of art historians say, is his prime in the 80s, he, with other Chicago artists painting in the 70s and 80s. And he was most famous for painting large canvases, exploring themes of America in a post-war era. And talking about the environments of America, the political, um, landscapes and the nature that surrounds us in this country and we can we will be able to see all of that in his artwork but I think the most important thing before we even see his artwork is to learn a little bit about him personally because if we learn about his history and how he grew up and who he is it'll kind of inform inform us as we look at his artwork So I couldn't find any photographs actually of a younger Roger Brown anywhere. So as I talk about his beginnings, we have this photo of him when he's 42 years old. So we can imagine we're looking at a younger Roger Brown. Well, he was born in December 1941 in Hamilton, Alabama. 
And that's where he ended up living all the way through high school, various towns around that area in Alabama. And it was said that he had a very pleasant childhood. He was always encouraged um, to do art by his parents, which is um, kind of the opposite of other artists that we have learned about. Some artists, like uh, the artist we looked at last week, Gail Kusama, she was not encouraged to do artwork when she was young. Whereas Roger Brown, he was actually encouraged and his parents put him in art lessons beginning the youngest of uh, when he was in second grade all the way through high school. So he was really encouraged to pursue his craft. And uh, he was said to have a strong connection to the environment he grew up, to the South specifically. He was fascinated by its way of life and what he called a material culture. Now, I know that when I say material culture, some things may come to your mind, maybe superficialism or um, that we only care about material things. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, to state that that's not what Roger Brown meant when he said material culture. Actually, what he was more fascinated by was the physical objects of a place, the materials of an environment. So he loved the handmade functional objects of the South. Handmade pottery, homemade quilts, cotton. What are the materials that make up a landscape, that make up a region? What is the folk art that um, represents the South? And that's what he was kind of fascinated by when he was younger. And so he really drew on those influences and we'll notice that throughout his artwork, through his career. So he was inspired by those forms of art, but he was also inspired by um, graphic art like um, comic books. And we will see those influences in his artwork as well. He would always read them as a young child. And he also always went to the theater and was also very inspired by Art Deco as a young child and architecture as well. So we can see how all of these influences, they're maybe beginning to build a frame of reference for young Roger Brown. The living in the South and being exposed to folk art while also being exposed to theater, architecture, um, comic books, all of those are kind of stirring together inside of young Roger Brown and kind of influencing his young artist self. And so while he had this innate desire to create art when he was young, and he did create art throughout his life until high school, he actually had a moment where he didn't know if he was gonna pursue it in a professional career. He graduated high school in 1960, and he briefly actually considered joining the Catholic Church in ministry because his family grew up very religious in the South, and he really believed that was a part of his identity when he was younger. And so he thought to himself, is this something I might want to pursue? So he had all of these artistic interests, but he was also had the interest of spirituality and Christianity. And so he did actually enroll in a ministry college, a Catholic college, but that only lasted for about two years. He decided that he did actually want to pursue the artist's interests inside himself and in 1962, he then moved to Chicago and enrolled in the Art Institute of Chicago for his Bachelor's of Fine Arts. And he ended up staying in the Art Institute as a student from 1962 all the way through the early, the early 70s, getting both his Bachelor's and his Master's degree from the Art Institute. So he really rooted himself in Chicago. And if we can think about how different moving to Chicago would be than from moving from the rural South or from Alabama. You know, moving to that big city that also had a lot of impact on him. I don't know if any of you moved from a different area to Chicago, um, but maybe you had a similar experience of getting that shock of urban life or how different the pace of life was when you move from one place to the other. Maybe some of you have only known living in Chicago and in that way, maybe this is what feels like home, the urban life. But for Roger Brown, it was very different. And that also influenced him in his artwork as well as we will find out. So that is what he, Roger Brown looks like. And let's look at his beginning of his artwork. Let's look at his early artwork while in school. 
So this is the image you may have seen earlier as I was giving you your preview. But this is an interesting um, image because it kind of showcases his exact style that he had when he was in um, a student at the Art Institute. And the interesting thing about attaining degrees at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, at least how it was when I went to school there, and maybe how it was, and I'm guessing how it was when Roger Brown went there as well, is that you don't have to choose a specialty to obtain a Bachelor's of Fine Arts or a Master's of Fine Arts. The great thing is it's a general degree that allows you flexibility to be able to choose classes that interest you. You could take a sculpture class and also take a painting class. And a lot of people will specialize that they'll then find an art form that they like and they'll spend most of their classes in that department refining their skills. But a lot of people kind of, it gives people and students the flexibility to explore. And that is um, what Roger Brown did when he was at school at the Art Institute. He um, had a wide range of interests and took a wide range of classes. He explored multiple art periods in art history and multiple styles. He took classes in surrealism and he also took classes in classic uh, Renaissance painting and non-Western art forms, art forms from um, the Middle East, art forms from Africa, art forms from Asia. And so he really had a, a wide range and wanting to get a lot of influences for his artwork. He was inspired by artists like Edward Hopper or George O'Keefe, two artists you may or may not know. But those were, those were what he was exposed to when he was in school. And, and let's kind of see that within this painting. So this painting here is titled Balcony, and it was painted when he was earning his master's in 1968. And as I mentioned before, a lot of his paintings in graduate school looked like this. They were very um, basic forms, very graphic forms, drawing from kind of surrealism, not super realistic. And Interestingly enough, a lot of the paintings were of scenes within a theater, just like the one we see here. We can see a screen kind of in front showing these two hands kind of up on the screen. And then we see uh, theater seats down here at the bottom and the curtains off to the side. And he was also beginning to explore his artistic style at this point. Um, we see a lot of dark tones, a lot of blacks, and then um, bold colors against that, a lot of shadow, kind of mysterious. That's very um, typical of Roger Brown's work. So he was starting to explore that. And um, remember I mentioned it was inspired, he was inspired a lot by comic book strips. You could see this in his early artwork. He would sometimes have blocks that looked like they were made out of a comic. Um, in his artwork, or it almost seems like this painting itself could be one uh, scene in a comic book. So it's very graphic in that way. And he actually said this of his early influences in uh, graduate school, and I'll say that. He said, comic books were very important to me when I was growing up. I particularly loved Marvel comics for their dramatic views of this city. And when I was at the Art Institute, I was fortunate enough to have this great teacher, Rei Yoshida, who encouraged us to go back to our early, earliest experiences of subject matter. He recalls, for me, that meant comic books and movies. When I was growing up, I often went to the movies twice a day because I loved being in this dark room full of glowing light, shadows, and silhouettes. It was so mysterious and beautiful to me so I started drawing interiors of movie theaters and immediately knew that I'd found a real beginning for myself. And I think that that quote is so beautiful because it really shows how Roger Brown was drawing on those earlier experiences of his life that we talked about. The life of going to the theater, of reading his comic books. And I think what a great way to mentor a student as a teacher to say, don't worry about painting something you don't know draw from your own experience. And I wonder if you've ever had a significant teacher tell you something like that um, while you were in school, or if you create your own artwork, if you find it's easier to draw from your own experiences, or maybe be inspired by something else.
I think it's an interesting question to see, you know, how, how our inspiration works and what, what we find that works for us. And for Roger Brown, that was those early experiences. He also said, and this is a quote about his particular fascination with the interior of theaters. And I chose this quote because as I, we talked about, this painting here, balcony, is an interior of a theater. And I thought, how fascinating, what an interesting scene to paint. And so I wanted to know more about his influence. And he said, around the time I began to paint interior theaters, an architect, Robert Venturi, came and lectured at the Art Institute. And he talked a lot about the imagery of small town America. It was liberating for me hearing Venturi validate styles unique to America because most training revolves around learning how to copy European artists. And I wanted to get back to something authentically American. And I think that this is an interesting idea about what does it mean to draw something that is authentically American? I wonder what scenes came to your mind when I said that. Did, a, did the theater come to your mind, the interior of, a, of a, an American movie theater? I think that that must be what Roger Brown was kind of drawing on that influence. But we can also think about that there's a variety of scenes that maybe feel very American to us. And it's interesting that Roger Brown was encouraged or was encouraged by some people and discouraged by others to draw things that were uniquely American. I think it's interesting that they were encouraged to copy European artists. And he kind of broke that mold and said, no, I want to showcase what small town America is like. What does the urban environment in America look like? It's unique. Um, and I think that that's very interesting. So I wonder if you feel like this looks American to you. We'll kind of look at, you know, more of these images as we go along about and think about do they look American? And I think that that's a theme that goes throughout all of Roger Brown's work. So that brings us to our next artwork. Now, this is a kind of one of the more famous images of Roger Brown. Because beginning in the 70s, his work really began to take off. I mean, he graduated graduate school, got his master's, and his artwork was really starting to be recognized in the larger Chicago community and in the United States. And part of that has to, be, has to do with being linked to a specific group of Chicago artists called the Chicago um, Imagists. And they were like-minded painters and sculptors who used a variety of media, but they really wanted to showcase popular culture at the time. And he was kind of linked with these artists mostly because he participated in a series of very famous exhibitions with them, very famous shows, one of them being called The Harry Who. And I don't know, maybe some of you watching had actually been to this, um, some of these shows when they were happening in Chicago, but The Harry Who is one of the more famous shows that really put Roger Brown on the artist map, you could say. And then he also started during this era of the 70s to do some of his first solo shows in New York and around the country. And um, because of his you know, newfound popularity in a lot of ways, his work began to evolve more than you know, just the images school. And so while he was connected to them, he started to differentiate himself as his own standalone artist, a solo artist. And a lot of that had to do with the success of his paintings, similar to this one, of street scenes and urban buildings. And uh, this is actually part of a series he did that he titled Disaster Paintings. And it was often these large skyscrapers that were experiencing fires, earthquakes, like we see here, um, or you know, other natural disasters. And they were very fantastical in nature and very, uh, they drew you in. This one actually is titled The Big Jolt and it was painted in 1972. And if you take a look at it, you can see here is a painting and at the top, the walls seem to be falling off of this large skyscraper. And we see inside people, they kind of look like they're panicking. Some people have their arms up. These people look like they might be getting thrown in the air. I mean, it's a very 
um, this person's falling, it can actually be very distressing to look at these um, images, these disaster paintings, but they drew people into them. They were, um, they were surrealist in nature, as we can see. It, it looks like this building is just existing. We're not sure where exactly it is. But these paintings were meant to provi provide a sort of stark backdrop to the contemporary American life um, and to show that disasters are still happening in our urban cities. He actually drew inspiration for these paintings from newspaper headlines he would read from around the country. And so he was drawing from real American life, real experiences, um, focusing on the urban landscapes. And um, these landscapes do look almost dreamlike, and we are kind of unsettled by them, at least I am. I'm not sure what emotions you're feeling as you look at this artwork. Maybe you're like me and you're a little bit like, wow, a little shocked, a little unsettled. But it's interesting that because of that, that's what draws us in. Have you ever heard this saying, I couldn't look away, it was like watching a train wreck? It's very interesting we have a saying like that. Sometimes when we look at things of disaster, we can't look away. There's something that draws us in about that. And I think Roger Brown was maybe capitalizing on that feeling. He was trying to show us that we do have that feeling within ourselves. And why do we think that is? It's very interesting. He didn't say anything about that, but that was just an observation I was making. And that's something that I was feeling when I was looking at the disaster painting series. I wonder what you think. I wonder if you even like it. I mean, do you like the way the style of artwork is? That it is so like, um, it has that comic book quality that we mentioned. And it's very simple and complex at the same time. And very bold. Again, we notice just like in the theater painting, he still has those black shadows contrasting against those other bright colors, which is characteristic of his work. So we'll move on to our next work. We're kind of moving on in um, his next phase. So we kind of, his phases kind of went, we, first we had the theaters and the comic strip like images that moved into more urban landscapes. Um, the, his disaster paintings, his paintings of buildings and uh, street scenes, houses. And then we move into a new phase called, which I'm calling his nature phase. I have one painting from then. So the next series of artworks by Roger Brown was mostly done in the 80s. And that's when he really, he took a step back from painting the urban landscapes and began to kind of focus more on painting landscape. Lakes, trees, ponds, flowers. And that's a startling difference if you think about content versus painting these disasters happening in urban landscapes. And I was very interested in finding out what kind of made him make that switch. And he actually said this about his nature series. He said, that work was a major turning point for me. The scale of my work increased considerably with the wildlife paintings. I began painting full scale figures then, and that was entirely new territory for me. So we're seeing it. He's had two decades of painting. He's now again, reinventing himself, venturing into new territory he's never done before. And part of this change has been credited to a change in his physical location. Roger Brown had been living in Chicago for much of the 60s and 70s. Um, he had been in a Chicago building on Halstead Street that was also his studio since graduate school. Uh, then in the 80s, he moved to the Michigan Dunes and New Buffalo, and he established a house and studio in Michigan. And this change provided of location provided him a whole new set of content, a whole new scenery and inspiration he didn't have in the city, and that's nature, and really, really being able to observe the changing in the seasons. When you live in Chicago, some of you um, may feel the same way that if you're, um, you can maybe feel connected to nature while being on the lakefront, but it's definitely a different experience to wake up in the morning and walk out on the street and hear all of the cars and see all of the tall buildings 
versus if you are waking up in an environment and you walk out your door and you're surrounded by trees and forest. That would kind of create a shift in me at least and maybe would in my artwork and that's at least what Roger Brown was seeing. And we started to see him painting flowers and grasses and trees and um, this here is part of that series that's titled Surrounded by Nature. And it was painted in 1986. Now, of all of his nature paintings, I decided to choose this one and because I think it was a little bit different. Um, some of his paintings would just show a tree or show grasses blowing in the breeze, and they wouldn't really have people in them. Um, sometimes they would, but most often they were just scenes in nature. But this one I thought was particularly different. I mean, we see here a nature scene. We don't see any buildings in this image. But it looks like nighttime, again, that dark tones that's classic to his style. And we see a ring of trees. But inside the trees, we see all of these yellow lights. Those are headlights of the cars. So we see a ring of cars inside the ring of trees. And inside are small figures, which actually have look like they're carrying guns pointed to nature, pointed to the outside of the ring of cars. And I just found that to be a very interesting image. Um, and I was wondering what the story behind this painting was. He titled it Surrounded by Nature, but it almost looks like these people are afraid of nature or they're um, almost seeming to protect themselves. And I wonder if you have any ideas about what he may have been alluding to in this painting or why um, he did depict nature in this way. I was trying so hard to find a quote about this work from Roger Brown, but I couldn't find anything. Um, so it's a mystery to us what his actual intention was behind it, but that's why I chose it. Um, he was painting nature, but he was also painting uh, humans, um, men in nature. So very interesting. Um, and I wonder what he's trying to say. But again, nature was the theme that ran throughout his work in the 80s. So that leads us to our next phase of artwork. It was interesting that each decade seemed to bring a new phase. So this is our last phase here. So in the late 80s, uh, Roger Brown was looking actually for another place to live. He has still had both studios. He still had his Chicago studio. He still had his Michigan studio, but he was actually looking to now live and move to the West Coast to continue to get a change of environment. And he actually built a house and studio in the beach town of La, uh, La Conchita, California. And he continued to make work, often still inspired by the landscape of California. He would do a lot of cloudscapes, rose trees, uh, focusing on a, also a new art form. So he was still doing his landscape work, but he actually then transitioned to a new art form, which he called virtual still life object paintings. And he kind of invented a new art form here. It was part photograph, part painting, part still life. Um, so it was very interesting. What he would do is he would build a shelf, and on top of that shelf, he would place ceramic objects, some of them being cups, bowls, as we can see here, a teapot. And he would paste, place that and organize them on the shelf, and he would create a backdrop to the still life that would be the painting. So he almost constructed these little, almost dioramas that he would then photograph, and that would be his artwork. And he created a vast series of these paintings, and the one we see here is titled Teapot with the Tempest. Tempest. And so we see a, a black shelf here and this white ornate teapot. And um, what looks like a tornado almost, um, I'm guessing that's the tempest, looking like it's rising out of that teapot. So it's a very interesting image, kind of dark and ominous a little bit. So this actually was one of the last series that Roger Brown worked on because unfortunately he died in um, 1997 after uh, nearly a decade of battling HIV and then eventually AIDS. 
And I noticed like um, when I learned this, that was actually very shocking to me because I thought that he lived for a lot longer, but he actually passed when he was 55. But he continued to make art up until the very end of his life. He still um, lived in California up until the last few years, um, but he continued to even make plans to move to, back to Alabama and get a property there. He was still making these still life paintings and still doing various sculptures up until the very end. And I think that really shows the testament of the power of artwork to get us through very difficult times or that allows us that focus when, when our bodies are in pain or maybe our minds are worried as we're kind of confronting new diagnoses and new worries throughout our lives. So even though Roger Brown was going through multiple hospitalizations, medications, pain, he was still creating up until the very end. What's also interesting to him, to me, about him is that while he was battling um, HIV and AIDS for a couple decades, it was a big part of his life and I'm sure took up a lot of his mental space. His artwork never really touched on the political or physical themes of HIV or AIDS or his personal experience that much. Um, and that was a deliberate uh, decision on his part, actually. He said this, I never wanted my art to be about my sexuality because my life is not about being part of gay culture. And so he, he really wanted to strive to escape being a one-note artist. He wanted to be known for his artwork and his its relation to American society, not so much his relation to either gay culture or the HIV and AIDS epidemic and fight. And that was a personal choice on his part. A lot of artists who were battling this choose to use their platform as a political platform to then you know, start discussing these ideas, but for Roger Brown, his artwork was still really about what it was when he was in graduate school and beyond. Really about confronting American culture, about showcasing small town America, showcasing our, the urban environments, bringing our attention to nature. And um, again, as I said, while he died in 1955, he left quite a large legacy. And what's interesting is it's not only woo, it's not only his artwork that he left behind, and this is what's so amazing about Roger Brown. He also left behind his various houses and studios, and he. Um, and this is also something that's interesting about him that I didn't mention before, but has been throughout his entire life is his love of collecting started when he was a graduate student at SAIC, he would go to flea markets and he would go to antique stores and he would begin to collect things to be inspired by, to build his home, to build his studio, to use within his own artwork. And this started a lifelong collecting habit. And so he filled his homes and studios with objects of all kinds, toys, comic books, um, various clothing, dolls, artwork from known artists and unknown artists from across the country and the world. And on, upon his death, instead of his family selling his artwork or instead of his, um, of then gifting to a museum of some sort, he then made his home and studio open to the public by gifting it to the Art Institute of Chicago. The Art Institute of Chicago received his house and studio in Chicago as well as Michigan and all of its contents, which is really a remarkable gift um, that Roger Brown selflessly made to the city of Chicago, but also many generations of artists um, to come. So. This actually um, at the top is the outside of his Chicago house and studio. It's actually on Halstead Street. Some of you may be there. It's actually open to the public. Um, and SAIC uses this building to have classes, to do tours. And I actually myself, when I was a first year at the Art Institute for Art Therapy, I walked inside Roger Brown's house and studio. And this is what it looks like on the inside. This is his living room, and you can see a table full of all sorts of pottery objects, 
and this was very characteristic of his house. There were little knickknacks and artwork in every nook and cranny. Everywhere you looked, there was something to look at. His own artwork or artwork of others, his various collections and toys. But what's most interesting is everything was left exactly how he left it, even down to the contents of his medicine cabinet, inside of his closets, everything was so perfectly preserved. And it really made you feel like um, you were walking into his life. He felt close to you and it was very inspiring. I remember taking pictures of everything I possibly could, wanting, um, wanting to document everything because it was so inspirational to me. And um, I think that's what I love most about Roger Brown is that he did feel like such a real person and vulnerable, vulnerable to me. He didn't feel like a larger than life artist. And I think that's why I enjoyed him and that he related to me and I related to his paintings about urban environments because they spoke to me in my experience of living in Chicago. And his nature speaks to me about the times I was out in nature. And, um, and I think that that's the idea I want to leave with you today. And I, I have one last quote about Roger Brown that I think showcases really his intention behind his artwork that we can still enjoy today and um, his reasoning behind, you know, his legacy. He says, I deal with things that are from my memory. My memory is probably much like everyone else's. I mean, we experience the same things in our society. All I try to do is deal with those common everyday things we all know. Obviously they are changed by my own way of presenting them, but otherwise it all comes out of everyone's experience. And I think that that's beautiful that making artwork about our everyday experiences can allow us to connect with one another because it's something that we all experience. And it makes me think of this time that we're in now how we may be separated or um, we may be different in our specific circumstances than others, but in a lot of ways, we're all connected in this same experience, just like we're all connected all the time, but now even more so. And so I would be interested to see if Roger Brown were alive today, what kind of artwork he would make to connect us all together um, in this moment we're in now. And that's maybe my challenge to you is, is what artwork can we make about this common experience we're all facing that everyone can relate to, something we all know. And um, so with that, there's so many interesting thoughts today and I hope you really enjoyed learning about this Chicago-based artist. And again, thanks so much for joining me. I look forward to this every week and I hope that you continue to send me um, any updates or your thoughts um, and comments. But I hope you all stay well, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye.